Hello and uh, welcome to The Independent, the independent politics team. That's me, John Rental. Uh, and uh, I'm joined by Lizzie Buchan, although I can't actually see her face. Lizzie, are you there? I am. Hello. Oh, yes, I can see your face. Marvellous. Um, technology. It's working, uh, I hope. Um, there are two billion people watching us, um, possibly. Every single YouTube user. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Possibly not. Anyway, we have just been watching um, PMQs, Prime Minister's Question Time. They are back after their break and after the farce of yesterday's uh, queuing system. Um, I thought Keir Starmer was surprisingly diffident and not very impressive. Um, I have to say, I thought he asked unfocused long questions again, and I thought Boris Johnson uh whacked back quite hard what did you think mm, interesting um i thought actually that starmer did quite well um unusually we're disagreeing <laughs> um, and i thought <laughs> that's what we're here for and i thought that the pm looked quite rattled actually as the exchange went on i mean starmer did the kind of technique that jeremy corbyn used to do where he asked six diff questions on different subjects which can be a bit of a difficult it can be a bit difficult because it makes it hard to you know pin the pm down on anything in anything specific and so yeah. Starmer kind of you know he moved through kind of issues with um you know test and trace looking at kind of all sorts of different issues around coronavirus but I did think that um as it went on whilst Starmer doesn't tend to sort of go for the big kind of moments the big like dr dramatic um language he by sort of question three or four the prime minister was starting to get quite almost quite shouty at one oh, point he was very he, cross didn't he yeah, back the dispatch box at one the point dispatch box sort of saying you know i could you know this is i can't believe that you're sort of refusing to collaborate with us sort of thing um and i actually don't think that that looks great to people watching i mean obviously the pm you know has a certain style and everyone knows that he's quite He's sort of the showman and he's not always entirely across the detail but i thought that you know starmer's so precise that actually i thought that whilst he did jump around a bit um he did you know he did look like he was giving the pm a bit of trouble but the, the whole sort of subtext of that exchange was about whether uh, the labor party is being helpful or not or cooperating uh, because um, Keir Starmer started by saying that he'd written this private letter uh, to the Prime Minister, but he hadn't got any reply. Uh, they're sort of implying that Labour were trying to be helpful and constructive, but the Prime Minister wasn't interested. And then the Prime Minister came back and said, yeah, but we spoke on the phone for some time and you agreed with everything I said. So I thought that was, um, I thought that was game set and match to, to the Prime Minister, but I mean, maybe um you think that came across badly no i think i think you're right that obviously the pm was able to come back on that and say you know we've had these conversations this letter was regarding the opening of schools again yeah. which has obviously been a highly charged argument between the government and the teaching unions um about what's the best and most safe way to do it um and Starmer said, you know, I've written this letter, which he has now published um, yeah. on the from the 18th of May, where he says, you know, you need we're happy to work with you on this, but you really need to be making sure that you're bringing the unions with you and talking to parents and that sort of thing. Um, also, I would say that, um, you know, sources in the leader's office uh, say that they believe that the telephone call the prime minister was referring to in his response was actually a group call with opposition leaders rather than a one on one. Oh, so we know that the PM has been doing these calls with opposition leaders to try and kind of bring them with him. But obviously, Labour would say that a group call with a number of other opposition leaders on a number of different subjects is not the same as taking Starmer up on his offer to discuss schools properly. Because right. in the letter, which I'm just looking at now, um, he asks for a meeting with Gavin Williamson, between Gavin Williamson, the Education Secretary, and Rebecca Long Bailey, the Shadow Education Secretary, which I don't believe ever materialised. So um, it's an interesting, it's it's something that we're also seeing a bit more from Team Starmer, that 
they are clearly using PMQs as a big political moment, which obviously it always used to be. And then under Theresa May, Jeremy Corbyn, it sort of drifted. Yeah. Um, but every week now we're seeing, you know, Starmer said that and immediately his team put out the letter, you know, they've done that a couple of times over the last few weeks of really like having quite a sort of well thought out and sophisticated comms operation around the PMQs exchanges. That is interesting and, and absolutely right. Um, I mean, I thought what, what seems to have happened, I think, is that when Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer first engaged, Boris Johnson was, expect, was taking him at his word about being a constructive opposition and was actually quite taken aback by the fact that Keir Starmer was being quite critical and being quite political and trying to score points against him. And uh, Boris Johnson has been sort of fighting back ever since saying, you know, you're not being, you're not being cooperative and constructive. You're actually just trying to uh, trying to score political points, um, and he was really being quite aggressive on that uh, today. Uh, and you know, I, I just felt that Keir Starmer wasn't sort of ready for that uh, for that pushback. It was certainly a different, a shift in tone today. I mean, we were slightly expecting it because ahead of PMQs, uh, Starmer had given this interview to the Guardian today, where he was sort of ramping up his language quite a lot and saying, you know, yep. the Prime Minister's got to get a grip, you know, the, the buck stops with him on, on all of this. And obviously that is quite interesting because, you know, Labour have been treading a very fine line recently on how to handle the coronavirus outbreak because obviously they don't want to be seen to be undermining the government at a time of national crisis. Exactly. But also Keir Starmer actually alluded in one of his answers to the fact that he's taken quite a lot of flack from his own party and from you know Labour supporters for not being more critical of the PM um, and for not sort of challenging him harder on the decisions that the government is making and I think he made he said at one point that you know I've tried to support the government but you're making it quite hard because yeah. of the way you've been behaving and I I don't know whether we're sort of reaching Labour have just decided that it, they've had enough or whether the actions of the government over the last few weeks have contributed, um, including, you know, the Dominic Cummings affair has obviously been very difficult for Labour to, you know, why would Labour support that? And also the lifting of the lockdown, um, despite the fact that the alert level, the PM promised that the alert level had to reach uh, three in a yeah. scale of five to... Um, move ahead with lifting lockdown but it's still on four and they're going ahead anyway so yeah. you know, the PM Labour can see the way the wind is blowing public trust in the government has fallen quite dramatically and so yes we Keir Starmer it. mentioned I mean it was yeah. interesting he actually mentioned opinion polls as a way of attacking uh, Boris Johnson and the Prime Minister didn't like that no and um it's it's interesting particularly because all governments are obviously mindful of opinion polls but this number 10 operation is very very like focused on focus grouping, on polls, on really trying to, they pride themselves on reading public mood, which is yeah. you know, why they think they, think the team in number 10 who were much part of the vote leave campaign during the referendum and also part of, you know, the big, the Tories big election win, you know, they think they can read the public mood and they thought that they could wear out, they could um, wear the Dominic Cummings, uh, yeah controversy and so these poor opinion polls are going to hit them quite hard I think yeah in terms of <laughs> no, they, yeah they pride themselves on their uh, opinion research and yet they didn't see how strongly 70 percent of the British public felt about the Dominic Cummings business absolutely uh, yeah um, you're right I was just going to say you're right that you know Starmer is taking a risk that this that going hard on the government could backfire for some, you know, in in some ways, some people will feel that they're they're being too critical. But maybe they've taken the decision that they can't sort of collaborate and support the government when there's the government is making to some decisions that are very clearly political themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And after, and as you say, after the the whole Dominic Cummings business, it makes it does it makes it difficult for Labour to to be too supportive. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But I thought I thought Keir Starmer sounded a little bit plaintive when he said, you know, the, the prime minister's mistaking scrutiny for attacks. Um, I mean, they're, they're engaged in a very interesting sort of boxing ring 
dance, aren't they? Where they're sort of trying to hug each other and yet get the punches in at the same time. Mm. Uh, is Keir Starmer doesn't, as you say, doesn't want to appear to be undermining the government's uh, approach to the virus, controlling the virus. And yet he knows that you know, public opinion is moving away from the government and he wants to be, uh, he wants to be ready to take advantage of that. Mm. And it's interesting that the biggest insult that they kind of come up with for each other is that they're being political about something, <laughs> as if everything they do isn't political. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a pretense that these decisions aren't political. Everything is calculated because that's what they do. And obviously the public don't like at the moment to see political, like people making, playing politics with decisions that are having such a big impact on people's lives um but if you know that is what is happening like just some people are better at presenting it in than others you know Starmer has tried quite hard to make it look like he's not being political which you could see um last over the bank holiday weekend that Labour didn't come out immediately and call for Dominic Cummings to be sacked they yeah. said you know this is this is if he's breached the laws this is very serious you know we really expect an inquiry but they didn't call for him to be sacked until a while later which is yeah. quite again quite interesting that kind of choreography yeah very well, clever I think because mm -hmm. uh, I think so. you want you want to stand back while your opponents are taking lumps out of each other um there was no and need for themselves you know uh, absolutely. Now, I've just found the bit where um, where Boris Johnson thumped the dispatch box. He said the alert level does allow, does allow it. It does. It does allow the, the easing of the lockdown that they've done, which is which is the point you were you were making that he previously gave the impression, at least, that it had to go down to um, it had to go down to level three um, before they could actually make any easing of the, of the lockdown. Um, but uh, I thought I thought that was just a word. I mean, again, you're saying that's playing politics, isn't it? I mean, Boris Johnson was was theatrically banging the dispatch box in order to try and make the point that he thought Keir Starmer was trying to undermine the government. Yep. And also his suggestion that the alert level does allow for the lockdown to be um, lifted is doesn't really bear out. I mean, the no. you know, the experts have said that you know it has to stay at four and this is a sliding scale for anyone who's not familiar with the sort of intricacies of the decision making is that five is the highest alert level and one is the lowest and so they you know they said that three was the point when we could start to ease the measures and the lockdown measures but I think the fact that the government has moved ahead with this despite the fact that you know that the scientists are saying I think Chris Whitty the chief medical officer apparently um made a big intervention and said no we can't refuse, refuse right. there. he said it wasn't it we couldn't move it down to three that kind of casts doubt on the whole alert system you know that the government said they were trying to make it so that people will feel confident that the decisions that the science is being followed that the decisions are being made in a logical and sort of straightforward way but actually if the alert system doesn't really matter then what was the point in it anyway <laughs> I think is the point that Keir Starmer was trying to make is that you know it's one of those things like that politicians come up with where they say you know, I'm doing five, it was like Labour's five tests for Brexit. I mean, yeah. you know, like just a way of them, you, you, a way for them to use an excuse not to take decisions. Um, so I think they've slightly, the government's undermined their own risk alert yeah. system by not abiding by it. And therefore it just shows that they're making the decisions when they want to. Absolutely. Well, they made the mistake of, of letting the scientists decide what the five tests were instead of controlling the uh, the tests themselves. Mm. What did you think of Keir Starmer's last answer? I mean, I mean, I thought he should have stuck with the coronavirus um, and and how how that's being tackled, but he went on uh, yesterday's chaos um, about voting in the House of Commons, uh, and the Prime Minister basically said, "Well, you know, it, it, the the people of the country have to queue to to go to Tesco or IKEA, so uh, MPs ought to queue as well in sympathy." <laughs> It's an extraordinary answer. It's it's like, yeah, people are queuing to go to the supermarket, but if my MP is queuing 45 minutes to get into Parliament, then they can't answer my questions about whatever <laughs> I need. You know, there's people with really serious 
concerns about access to benefits, access to healthcare, whatever that they need, you know. And if their MP is spending all their time in queue, you're just wasting time. And MPs are inundated yeah. with, you know, constituency work as well as like attempt, you know, their efforts, whatever their jobs are in terms of like either front bench roles or committee roles in scrutinizing the government. It's just a waste of time. <laughs> um, I thought. What, I mean, was it the right thing for Keir Starmer to go on? I mean, shouldn't he have let that? left that to other other people and, and focus much more on i mean jeremy hunt came in with a with a question about how quickly test results can be returned and you know Bo boris johnson rather sarcastically said that's the sort of question that Keir Starmer ought to have been mm -hmm. asking that was a good question from jeremy hunt um i suppose Keir Starmer could have not asked about it and could have concentrated on other things but i thought it was interesting in that he managed to uh, elicit an answer from the pm about um, proxy voting, which was oh, yeah, that's right. quite interesting because obviously there's quite a lot of MPs who are either elderly or shielding because they've got disabilities that put them particularly at risk. And those MPs are unable to vote. And the PM said that MPs who are shielding will be able to vote by proxy, which is not what Jacob Rees-Mogg said yesterday. So in yeah. a way, it was worth Keir Starmer asking that question because that means that those disabled MPs will now have a better way for vote, but better way to vote, really. Yeah. Um, because that right. whole thing, the whole rollout of voting was a bit of a mess yesterday. Um, and it is important, even if it, you know, it, it might seem like a side issue to people who, you know, are losing family members and are undergoing significant financial hardship. and all the other things that people are enduring at the moment but I think that you know dealing with kind of representation of the public is important in parliament and if you've got a number of MPs who can't do their jobs properly then that mm. that is an issue so I, yeah. I did think that was that was quite interesting um the other thing as well that was quite interesting is that at the beginning Keir Starmer managed to finally get Boris Johnson to say that Black Lives Matter which he has oh, yeah. so far <laughs> Um, because but not to say that he's going to uh, he's do anything going about to it. But... Donald Trump, his disapproval. <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting that the PM didn't say anything at the beginning in his opening remarks about the uh, the George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, and the protests in America. Um, because often, you know, prime ministers will refer to moments to you know large stories developing overseas and that sort of thing in their um, in their yeah. opening remarks. That's true. Um, something Keir Starmer didn't mention, of course, is the big story today, which is the 14 day quarantine for international arrivals. Um, it was raised by a couple of Labour MPs. I think um, Ben Bradshaw certainly certainly raised it. And of course, then you saw why Keir Starmer hadn't, because the Prime Minister said, well, hang on a minute. I thought uh, I thought Labour actually supported this quarantine policy. Um, so what is Labour's position, do you think? Oh, good question. Um, the quarantine thing is, in general, is is just a bit of a mess because, you know, there's the the Tory MPs don't want it, and there's lots of and some of, Labour MPs, it would seem, and some Labour MPs don't want it because they're concerned on a number of levels about what it will mean for kind of various different sectors and also how it would be enforced, which mm. it, it doesn't seem very it doesn't seem very straightforward how it's going to be enforced um so yeah there's a lot of kind of uh disquiet about that plan but what's interesting is that the public really support it um the sort of polling shows that yeah that it's it's popular amongst members of the public so i think mps are in a bit of a tricky spot there about yeah. what how best to proceed on it um, yeah, I think Labour, you know, had been calling before for, quite, you know, restrictions uh, on people kind of coming into the country and testing and that sort of thing. So it's hard for them to say now that they don't yeah. support it. So, but it yeah. Does seem a bit of a, it seems a bit of a sort of PR stunt, given that, you know, lorry drivers and others aren't, aren't included. So you, most international traffic isn't covered. It's, it's just tourists who can't... Mm -hmm. uh, who can't come or go yeah um, but yeah um then we saw um theresa may uh, actually asked a question mm -hmm. right towards the end i i didn't follow it uh properly because i was trying to set, set this up but did did you catch her question it was about brexit wasn't it 
Yeah, and it involved a lot of acronyms. Um, she, <laughs> she was basically asking about, um, as far as I could understand from all of the acronyms, some of which I, I'm not familiar with, were she was asking about how we continue to maintain sort of security after Brexit. So she was asking about access to sort of data sharing with European countries, um, which has been quite a, was before coronavirus, quite a big issue in terms of the Brexit talks um, about how you continue to work with European police forces, how you sort of track criminals across countries and that sort of thing. So she was asking about that, which, you know, security is something that Theresa May was very focused on because obviously having yeah. had been a Home Secretary before. Um, and Boris Johnson said, you know, basically, uh, we're thinking about it, but it's, we've got to have, it's going to be subject to our negotiation. So she didn't really get an answer out of him. No. But um, it was Most interesting. Most didn't really get an answer out of the Prime um, Minister. Although there was one, one interesting question about the, uh, the Laura Ferris, the Conservative backbencher, was asking about the rough sex defence, and he, yeah, he did, that was uh, that was inexcusable. Yeah, uh, in violence against women, which I thought was, yeah, again, it was an, it was an important answer from the Prime Minister. Yeah, and I think that's a um, more robust answer than he's given in the past and that the government has given in the past on that issue. And also Laura Trott, I think, was it? No, Laura, sorry, Laura Farris, uh, the MP that asked that. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I wondered whether, you know, maybe she'd had some conversations with the PM's team about that in advance, because sometimes right. they do. Um, but yeah, I thought that was quite an interesting Con, you know concession and maybe shows that perhaps they are thinking about that kind of behind the scenes because obviously much of the government bandwidth is occupied with coronavirus but they are keen to show that they are doing other things as well um and there yeah, there were a couple of questions about sort of leveling up and police and that sort of things hs2 and you know the prime minister was trying to be sort of say you know yes we are committed to all of these these issues even if we don't appear to be doing anything about them so yeah, yeah i think that was that was quite interesting um and um oh and another one i thought was quite interesting as well was uh ian blackford asked about uh, the sales of uh, arms and rubber bullets to the us which is something um our colleague john stone has been writing about quite a lot uh, about yeah. kind of us the labor uh, initiative yesterday and uh, the SNP obviously decided that if Keir Starmer doesn't want it then uh, mm. they'll take it. Yeah Labour have been a bit sort of slow on that but there's been a number of calls from people like Amnesty and that sort of thing to try and stop the sales of rubber bullets and, and other kind of riot gear to the US where it's clearly being used on protesters and some journalists and things like that so um you know the prime minister gave the same answer that he they always give around sales of arms to yemen and things like yeah. that and said we've got the most robust controls in the world on this sort of thing but that's i thought that was quite interesting that they chose to raise that at pmqs because it's clearly something that's getting a bit of momentum yeah absolutely um so what did you think of the uh, back to business in the chamber PMQs because Ian Blackford normally uh, addresses us from a screen up on high with his tartan blind background uh, mm. but he was in the chamber himself. Um, I thought the uh, the only difference really was that there's a bit more noise on the Labour side this time. I mean when Keir Starmer stood up there were cheers for him but the Conservative benches didn't make much noise for Boris Johnson. Yeah, I, I thought that um, obviously they're still very strictly limited on the number of MPs that they can have in the chamber. So that does make a difference on the noise levels. And I think the last couple of weeks they've tried, really, the Tory whips have tried really hard to get Tory MPs into Parliament so that they could give the PM a bit of a boost because he he was, he has been struggling a bit against Starmer compared to yeah. who's a much more difficult opponent than Jeremy Corbyn was. Um, so yeah, they, the last couple of weeks we've heard a lot more noise from the Tories, but clearly there are more, they had more Labour MPs in today and there was a bit more noise on that, which is quite interesting. But um, it didn't feel like, it felt like loads louder than <laughs> no, it, well, no, it can't be loud when they're all at two metres. Yeah, because Ian Blackford, because the Labour front bench and the government front bench have been doing PMQs in person and it's yeah. only been really kind of members of the 
SMP and the Lib Dems and that sort of thing who've been phoning in remotely. Um, but I think the SMP Nicola Sturgeon gave some kind of concession to an, a small number of SMPs and MPs to come down because their lockdown rules are still sort of saying that, you know, they shouldn't be traveling far and that sort of thing. So I think a couple yeah. of them have come. Um, but yeah, it does make a difference having them speak in the chamber because whilst, you know, the hybrid system has been quite useful, um, it, it is just easier to hear people. It's easier to kind of get a read on the exchanges, that sort of thing. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think it it's good to have more people back in the chamber but i think you know there are certainly still a lot of questions remaining about how they get parliament operating in a reasonable way yeah well we're in danger of saying jacob rees mogg is has got a point but uh, we don't want we don't want to do that the prime minister has also got a point which is that people who can't attend in person really do need to be represented mm. you need to be able to take part and to vote Absolutely. Um, and, and, and social distancing needs to be maintained. And as you would, as we both well know, and anyone who has ever been in Parliament would know, it is a very, it's not a modern workplace in any way. Like it's yeah. very cramped. There's a lot of like tiny corridors you have to go down, small lifts. You know, it's very hard to social distance, as we could all see from those ridiculous queuing pictures, how far they had to do the queue round to make sure that people were doing it. So I think, you know, MPs are obviously concerned about spreading the virus in their constituencies and amongst themselves in Westminster. So that is something that we still need to really be bearing in mind, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Lizzie. Um, that's, uh, that's the end of our uh, review of Prime Minister's discussions for today. Um, we've been admiring your curtains very much. Uh, <laughs> I'm I shall... blending in. <laughs> I shall now press the mute button and then I think we'll be turned on. Thank you. Thank you very much.